we'll just give the Lord some praise in his house this morning. It's still the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that saves us from our sin. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Return to your seat. Thank you for worshiping with us. We're honored to have you today. Thank you for being here. Thank you, visitors, for being here. Palm Sunday. Amen. Palm Sunday. What a beautiful, beautiful week we are entering into. And there is no way in the divine plan of God that my wife and I could have ever figured out that not only would we be ministering in Israel, but that it would be during uh, their Holy Week <laughs> and on Good Friday, which was an extraordinarily bad Friday, but Sunday was coming. Amen. And uh, we're going to work on this mic a little bit, guys. I don't know what we did to it, but we're going to have to change it so I can get a little closer to my mouth. But it's super echoey up here. Apologize for having to say something out loud, but we're going to have to fix that because it's going to be super distracting while I'm preaching. But I want you to remember us in the morning. Men, we'll still have 6 a.m. Bible study. Our flight doesn't leave until about 10 o'clock. And so we'll still have uh, our time to finish together the book of Genesis in the hospitality room. Uh, that room has been packed out every single Monday morning uh, when I'm in town. And men have just been in there and we've been studying the Bible. It, it, it's the longest running small group uh, teaching time that we've ever had here at the church other than a regular service. It's gone for many, many years, and we have a number of our men that have been to just about every single one of them for a lot of years. And so, men, we still will have our Bible study in the morning at 6 o'clock, and then well, my wife and I will fly off to Israel and then get back super, super late on Saturday night and still be here for Resurrection Sunday. Amen. It's going to be a great time. It's going to be beautiful. I want you to take your text in the book of Leviticus, if you would, please. Don't groan and don't sigh. It is the word of the Lord. Amen? So I want you to go to the book of Leviticus, and we're going to remind ourselves theologically where we've been for the last month in this series, of which we thought was just going to be a Wednesday night series on what the glory of God produces in our life. And then on that Sunday, the Lord said, mash the gas and keep going. And so now every Sunday and Wednesday, we've been picking up theologically and expositionally where we left off. We've been through the entire book of Exodus, and we've seen what does the glory of God produce in our life. You see, it's one thing when you get involved in the rat race of church growth. And we've been caught up in that, and it's easy to get there. But know this, the same media that builds you up is the same media that eventually will destroy you when you say something that's against what they're propagating. And we've been there. We've done that. And so we had to get to a place where we shifted and the Lord took us to a new season and really a new hour where we said, it's not about how many people we can cram into a hot or a cold tent. It's about how much of the glory of God can be produced in our life on a regular basis. How much are we spending time in the secret place? Because thy father which seeth thee in secret shall, shout, shall, that's affirmative. He shall reward us openly. And so there has to be those moments that we are seeking and contending for the glory of God. And so I want to show you today in the next book in the progression, the book of Leviticus, that it's not a boring book. It's not a book just about rules and regulations. Yes, they are there. But they are guardrails in the Old Testament to help us understand the fear and the holiness of the Lord. Because look, all this Bible reading marathon that we've been involved in for the last few months, it has allowed me to understand in my small brain just really how much of the holiness of God the church and the American culture has divorced itself from. Absolutely. We use the most ridiculous methodology on the planet. And I'm not against methods. But I am against methods that bring a lack of purity to the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I am all for unity. But I am not for mixture. Did you hear me? And there's a difference. Everybody talking about unity, unity. Listen, I want to unify biblically doctrinally around the presence and the fellowship of the glory of God, but I am not yoking up and being mixed with people that deny the centrality and the importance of Jesus Christ being the one and only way to heaven. As a matter of fact, here's what God said about that crowd. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. 
and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So I'm going to get to Leviticus, but I want to chit-chat as your pastor for a minute, okay? I'm not ranting, but I'm ranting. Everybody has seen the viral clips going around about churches saying things like this. Well, you know, we're a church that's trying to reach people that are far from God. So therefore, around Easter, around resurrection, whatever you call it, we don't use words like the blood of Christ. We don't use words like the cross. We don't talk about crucifixion. We don't talk about resurrection. If you don't talk about resurrection all the time, you're in a mess. But if you don't talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ... And the fact that we don't serve a dead Jew in a Palestinian tomb. I'm here to tell you, something is wrong with a church that theologically takes all the words out of their, you know, their vocabulary because they're abrasive words. The gospel is abrasive. You are dead, doomed, damned, depraved, disobedient, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. For by grace are you saved. He that knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And now you got these viral videos floating around from these mega churches, and I call them mini pastors because they're not grown men of the gospel. I don't care how big their church is. I don't care how many book, selling, uh, book signings they do. It doesn't matter how, how many movie theaters they pack out. I'm telling you, when you move away from the truth of the gospel, you're a false prophet. And these guys are saying, well, we, don't, we don't want to talk about the blood because we're trying to reach people that are far from God. So let me tell you how that works, okay? They're like, listen, we don't want to offend lost people. Because, here's what they say. I'm getting to my preaching. Okay, I'm warming myself up. We don't want to offend lost people because we may turn them away from God. Listen, where are you going to turn them away to? Hell number two? They're already lost. They're already under the judgment and the condemnation of God according to what John chapter 3 said. And we're like, well, you know, I just don't want to bring it up because, you know, I, I might offend them. No, no, you don't want to bring it up because you might embarrass yourself. So here's what we'll do. We'll change the terminology. I don't, I, I, we're preaching to the choir, but you just need to know this has been so super viral this week. I got to deal with it. So we, we'll change the terminology because we don't want to offend lost people, but we'll change it into something that's highly offensive to God, and that doesn't even bother us. Right? Am I doing okay? We're like, well, you know, we don't want to talk about resurrection, cross, crucifixion, and blood because it will offend lost people. But if you have a whole church full of people that follow Jesus, why is it that you will be willing to offend them by talking about bunnies and eggs and a bunch of nonsense that has nothing to do with the resurrection? The church in America has lost its way, ladies and gentlemen, and we emphasize stuff that God cares nothing about and then don't emphasize the very thing that Jesus came for. So that will automatically flow into the context of where we're going today because one of the things that the glory of God is going to produce in our life is separation. Separation. Now, you know, when I, when I was growing up and uh, my, my former youth pastor is here, actually on the front row. He put up with me for a long, long time. He's still putting up with me to this day. What we were involved in movement-wise was... When the buzzword of separation was used, what that meant was you carry a King James Bible, women don't wear pants, don't ever go to a movie, don't wear too much makeup, and say amen at the right points, even if it's not scriptural, right? And so at the end of the day, we were involved with people that conformed themselves to an outward set of rules. Now, I am all for standards, but you can force standards on lost people. And standards can be something that you worship and you can go to hell. Because at the end of the day, lost people do not need my standards. They need my Savior. And when they get my Savior through the process of Holy Spirit sanctification, they will get themselves some standards. So I am for you living and looking right, right? But separation is so much more than not watching a PG-13 movie. It's so much more than any of those things that we've been taught. Separation is a healthy fear and reverence for just how holy God really is. Because I'm going to tell you something. I don't have to live by a rule book if I walk in the fear of the Lord. He will be my rule book and I will not want to displease him and live my life in rebellion. Because rules without relationship creates rebellion. You don't believe me, you don't have kids or grandkids. Just give them a bunch of rules, but never love on them and see what happens. See if they're not the first one when they turn 18 to get out. 
You, you know what God did in the book of Exodus, right? He said, I love you, I love you, I redeemed you, I brought you out of Egypt, the horse and the rider, hath he thrown in the sea over and over and over. And then in chapter 20, he said, now let me give you some rules. Because even God knew that you can't give people rules who you have not created a valuable relationship with because when you have rules with no relationship, you become a rebel. It's just the facts. And so God is now going to show his people this is what it looks like when you walk in a healthy fear of the Lord. Now, we're going to be in Leviticus and the ninth chapter. But before we get to our uh, few texts that we're going to use today, I just want to quickly remind you what we're talking about, right? It's the Old Testament word, kavod, the glory of God, the presence of God, the manifest glory of God. And look, when a church, when a family, when an individual is walking in the fullness of the glory of God, know this. No one will have to preach an entire series a month long to tell you. I never am going to have to get up and say, ladies and gentlemen, revival is here. When revival comes, the glory of God will be its own manifested billboard, and I won't have to get up and beg you to come to church on Facebook. You see, there is such a lack of the glory of God in our churches. We have to have all of these circus clown routines to get people to show up. But the problem is, when your circus act is done and the hot dog smothering in onions wears off, the bigger church down the road starts having Papa John's pizza and everybody goes there because what you get them with is what you keep them with. And if you grow a church by feeding the sheep, not slopping the hogs and entertaining the goats, then the sheep you feed will not only show up, they will bring other people with an open plate of a Bible and say, let's go where the man of God's going to feed us what the Bible actually says. So we've dealt with the fact that when the glory of God began to manifest itself unusually in the book of Exodus, it brought about several things. I'm not going to rehash all of them because we've been doing this for a month. The glory of God produces in us, number one, surrender. At the burning bush, he said, okay, Lord, you said it. Here's your glory. I'm going. I will go. You in rebellion are not in the presence and the glory of God. You cannot have a consistent walk with God and live in rebellion. Because 1 Samuel 15, 23 says rebellion is a sin of witchcraft, okay? And so it produces surrender. Number two, it produces freedom. Remember how the glory of God manifested itself? A pillar of a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. What did the fire and the cloud represent other than the glory of God? The freedom of coming out of Egypt. And so know this, when you walk in the presence of the Lord, when you have a consistent, not just a Jesus calling devotional life, not just, you know, I read Psalm 23, you know, the last couple of days and I've done my duty to God and man. No, when you have a real devoted life, it'll bring freedom. You see, we get a lot of criticism for deliverance ministry and sometimes rightly so because deliverance ministry has been given a black eye by people on YouTube that just want, you know, a lot of people to be following them and they put a camera in everybody's face that's demonized and we're not in it for the clicks and the likes and the shares. But I'm gonna tell you something about freedom. The reason the church, even our church at times, has so many repeat offenders is because some of y'all need deliverance from deliverance ministry. If you really walked in a healthy relationship in the presence of God, you wouldn't stay under attack so much. You see, the only reason you're supposed to put on the armor of God is, get this, everybody always says, well, I don't believe a, a, a Christian could ever be attacked by a demon. Well, I don't believe you've read much of the Bible because you know what Ephesians 6 says? The only reason you put on the armor of God is to stand against the wiles of the devil. The armor of God is not for your flesh. The armor of God is not for the world. The armor of God is not for the culture. The armor of God is to fight the devil. And if you put on the armor of God, suit up and boot up and get in the prayer closet and spend time in the glory, it will produce freedom in your life that you will not otherwise have. Am I making sense? But then we found out that the glory of God produces provision. We preached a whole sermon on manna. Okay, I've been preaching for a long time, and I've heard very few, if any, full-blown sermons, 45-minute messages on manna, which means what is it? But I remind you, God didn't call it manna. They called it manna. What did God call it? God said when you wake up in the morning, you'll see the glory of God on the ground. God called manna the glory of God. Why? Because when you dwell in the presence of God, he will provide for your needs. 
Uh, Philippians 4.19 is not a verse that's written for every lazy, lukewarm believer to quote. Well, you know, the Bible says, my God shall supply all of my need. Yeah, read two and a half verses earlier where they gave to the needs of the apostle Paul when he was in jail, and then they fretted about their bills, and Paul said, because you've given, don't worry, my God shall supply all your need. Why? Because when you live in the glory of God, provision will be your portion. It's the facts. And then we learned in Exodus chapter 24 about reverence. Reverence. And we even closed a few open doors that Wednesday night on this platform and said, you know what? We're going to walk in a more reverent. I get it. It's just a tent. I, I get it. It's, it's just a building. I get it. But we, be, we better respect in a healthy manner what God's doing in this place because he's not doing it all over America. He's just not. And we better respect that. And we better guard that. We better be guardians of the glory of God and not allow things to infiltrate that would cause us to be distracted from the glory of God. For example, I just think about things randomly. Today, I'm not going to mention any names and call anybody out. I don't even think they're here anymore. But today, I, I did a picture this morning when I was walking over with an individual. And it was funny because in the staff feed, they were like, check this cat out. Right? And it was cute. And there was a time that I would have thought, oh, well, that's just so cute. You know, that's just so overt. Check that out. But I sent them a message and I said, I'll tell you something. Be kind to him and love him, but he's a distraction from what God's trying to do in our church. I don't come to church to see you. And if you come to church to see me, you need to go to another church. Okay? Talk about deliverance ministry. Get some deliverance from Greg Locke worship. The healthiest thing that ever happened in our church is when people that came here for me left. Now, I pray they come back, but they're going to have to get a healthy understanding and reverence for the things of God. We are guarding what the Lord is doing here because he's not doing it everywhere. And I get it. God's glory is all over the world. The heavens declare the glory of God. I understand that theologically. But know this, the God that dwells everywhere still desires to dwell somewhere. And you can't deny the fact that there are certain places where it just seems like God is moving amongst his children more than at other places. There must be a reverence in that. But then we talked about Exodus chapter 33 last week. We talked about the fact that the glory of God produces conviction in you. Very few people have conviction. They have a lot of convenience. The American church is full of convenience, but not a lot of conviction. Because we have people that say, well, you know, I'll die for Jesus, and they don't even live for him. You know what COVID showed us? It showed us there's people that will get mouthy on Facebook and say, I will go to jail for my faith. Those people didn't even go to church for their faith. Because their cowardly pastor closed it down and made everybody mask up. We believe in healing unless a pandemic hits, right? And so, again, not getting all that politically, but I'm just saying... If you have convictions, there are things you'll live for and things you'll die for. There's some stuff I'll fight with you about, I'll fuss with you about, but there's some theological convictions I have, I would die for them without hesitation. Without hesitation. And if you don't live that kind of life, you are for sale, and I feel, so, feel sorry for you. The church in America is so sold out. So many pastors that I've known that I hobnob with in green rooms when we should be hobnobbing in a prayer room, they're so sold out to the beast system. But when you consistently begin to walk in the glory of God, conviction will overshadow you. You will be considered an angry jerk by everyone else, but by God, you'll be considered a convictionally passionate person. If convictionally is a word, and it is now, praise God. But then we also talked about two more, and that was identity and direction. All of those out of the book of Exodus. How did Moses learn his true identity? Because it was God that revealed it to him in the midst of the fiery mountain encounter with God. And we talked about the fact, live your life in a way that people see you the way God sees you. You need your identity back. And so many people in the church world, the reason they do struggle with a spirit of heaviness, the reason why there are so many pastors, pastors that come to me on a monthly basis and need deliverance from alcoholism is because they've lost who they are because the church and the deacon board and the elders and the denominational structure and the hierarchy has made them wear the clothes of King Saul. But how many of you know David couldn't fight Goliath in somebody else's outfit? 
And some of you are wearing stuff that other people put on you, and you better take it off and get robed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ and find out who you are, and you will never find out who you are unless you get in the presence of God. And then lastly, it brings direction. You remember what the Bible says? When the glory of God lifted in the form of the cloud, they followed. And Numbers 33 tells us every location they followed for 40 years. You ever notice how you got those maps in the back of your Bible? Some in the front of your Bible? I know how you got them. Numbers 33 tells you they went from here to here to here to here to here to here. It tells you geographically and historically exactly where they went for 40 years. And the Bible says when the glory of God lifted and moved, they followed. When the glory of God stayed, they would stay, sometimes multiple years. Because when you are consistently in the presence of the Lord and wanting to understand his word, for we have meat that you know not of, Jesus said. And when we're praying and we're fasting and we're trying to truly be the kingdom-minded people in his presence that he's called us to be, not just publicly, but more important, privately, what happens is you will have direction for your life. If you are a person that is confused about what to do, I would say turn off Netflix, get out of Facebook and put your face in the book and get in God's presence. Because what you are doing is telling on yourself. If you consistently do not understand the will of God for your life, it's because you consistently are not dwelling in his presence. That's the facts. When he moves, you move. When he stops, you stop. What did we say Wednesday night? The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, but the stops of a good man are ordered by the Lord as well. Wait on the Lord. Now, Leviticus chapter 9. I want to give you quickly these two very important things. But again, please do not think that this is a mundane, monotonous book of nonsense. This is a powerful book. On this Bible reading marathon, the 27 chapters of Leviticus have become dear friends to me. They are powerful chapters that you can't even understand the high priestly role of Jesus or the book of Hebrews if you do not understand the Leviticus, the law, the priesthood. It's powerful. It's powerful. So for the first eight chapters... He deals with seven major systems of sacrifice. And although we don't have time to develop this, no. When Jesus said in John 19, 30, it is finished, he fulfilled all seven of those major sacrificial systems, all of them. And I'm sure I'll learn a little bit more about that when I go to Israel this week, and it's going to be good, and I'm going to come back so fired up, I'm going to fly around this tent next Sunday, praise God. <laughs> Leviticus chapter 9, look verse 5 and 6. And they brought that which Moses commanded before the tabernacle of the congregation. And all the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. Now, that which they brought was the commandments that God's been giving him for the last eight or so chapters. All the different times, the fire on the altar shall never go out. That's not a cute song. That's a Bible verse. That's a command in the word of God. So they brought these things before the Lord. Look at verse 6. And Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord commanded that ye should do. And, watch this, when they did it, the glory of the Lord shall appear unto you. Look at verse 23. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto the people. And there came a fire out from the Lord from before the Lord. And what did it do? Consumed upon the altar. Shout altar. Now watch this. The burnt offering and the fat, which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. Why? Because the glory of God will produce sacrifice in your life. It will produce sacrifice in your life. Now I'm not saying that you got to go back and sacrifice animals. That's not the point. Jesus fulfilled that. But the point is, the glory of God came upon the people in a public manifested way when they obeyed and the commands of God to bring forth a sacrifice. And when they brought forth the sacrifice, they fell on their face because the glory of God consumed the sacrifice. And the reason so many people have a lukewarm, mamby-pamby, you know, fake it till you make it, Jimmy Carter smile Christianity is because it cost them nothing to serve the God they say out loud that they love so deeply. Get quiet. I like it quiet better than I do when you're shouting. You know what Jesus said? Hate your father, mother, brothers, 
sisters, yea, in his own life also. And if he doesn't, he can call himself a Christian, but he can't call himself a disciple. And by the way, he's not telling me that I got to go around and justifiably and legitimately hate people. That, that's that's anti-gospel, right? What he's saying is your love for Jesus ought to be so sacrificially great that your love for anybody else would pale in comparison and seem like hatred. How many people do we know like that? Even, yay, in this room, ourselves and me with the microphone that love him so deeply and so passionately that everyone else we love know they had to take a back seat to the presence of Jesus in our life. Now, there's something interesting that I, that I need you to see because I think we've missed this. You, you ever see these pictures, right? And, uh, and I've gone through so many of these pictures, kind of, you know, rebuilding some tabernacle details for the little museum and all of that. You ever seen these pictures where the fire of God is coming from an open heaven down upon the altar in the, in the tabernacle? You know what I'm talking about? You, you've all seen those pictures. That is cute, but it's unscriptural. Do you know where the presence of God dwelt when it came to the tabernacle? Between the two golden cherubims. That, that was where the presence of God was. Look what the Bible in detail expositionally says. This is important. Watch this, verse 24. There came a fire out from what? Before the Lord. It does not say there came a fire down from the Lord. You see, we always see the pictures of the fire coming down to consume the altar. No, the fire came from the top of the glory of the ark of the testimony and it shot out that way right to the altar which was right out in front of it in the courtyard and consumed it in front of everybody. The fire didn't come down from heaven. It came out from the presence of the Lord. Is that plain in the Bible? That's what it says. It says it four times, by the way. A fire came out from the presence of the Lord and devoured it. Why? Because God loves the sacrifice of his children. So when you live, not just financially, but in every way, so when you live greedy and stingy, don't expect much presence in your life. Because the presence of God is magnetically attracted to sacrifice and obedience. Am I making sense? It's that simple. Now, I was thinking about something the other day, and, and this has everything to do with the message, but we don't have time to go to the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. We're getting very close to the actual you know, day of Pentecost. Of course, we know it'll be 50 days after the resurrection of Christ. Pentecost means 50. But if you look in Acts chapter 2, you can jot it down. And in verse 1, it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, which I find interesting because we've been telling people for years, just wait on the Spirit, just wait on the Spirit, just wait on the Spirit, just wait on the Spirit. Stop that nonsense. Stop it. They were told one time to wait, and 10 days later, there was no more wait. Why? Because the day was fully come. Stop waiting on the Holy Ghost. He's been waiting on you for 2,000 years to get your ducks in a row and start living in obedience. Oh, the old-timers used to have what they call the tarrying meetings. We're tarrying for the Lord. Well, how long are you going to tarry? Till he shows up. He already showed up. Quit tarrying. Get up. Dust off your Bibles and walk in the presence and the fullness of God. But nonetheless, here's what grabbed me. This struck me. The Bible says in the next verse that they were all with one accord and one mind, about 120 of them in an upper room. And I read this the other day, Pastor Jesse, and it motivated righteousness right into me. And I thought, man alive, how can I read the Bible so much and still miss these juicy Holy Spirit details? It says, and a cloven... Right Now look, when it talks about cloven tongues of fire, that's different than the tongues that were expressed and represented to the 18 nationalities in the next few verses. Cloven tongues of fire, hoofed, split tongues of fire, flickering flames. Here's what the Bible says. Sat upon each of them. You know, we have this idea that you will automatically be blessed of the Lord by the atmosphere that you just walk into. No, no, no. I know people that can sit in a church that's full of the glory and never get any of it. Jesus turns to his disciples at one point. He's like, do you not get what I'm saying? Nope. La, 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 la. Smurf syndrome. Church is full of addicted to it. But here's what the Bible says. That the flame... Representation, the power and authority of the Holy Spirit 
for the newness of the early local New Testament church, which is still the pillar and ground of the truth, the Bible says that it sat upon each of them. Notice, it wasn't one flame collectively over all of them. Each one of them had their own flame. And I felt like the Lord said in my spirit, tell the people, there's a flame with your name. You don't get my flame. You don't get my oil. You better get your own flame. You better get your own oil, and it's going to take sacrifice. Somebody came to the great late preacher, Leonard Ravenhill, who knew more about revival than I'll ever know a day in my life. And somebody said, Mr. Ravenhill, we want the anointing and the power that God has placed upon your life. He said, that's a funny thing. Because everybody wants my anointing, but nobody wants my sackcloth and ashes. It'll cost you something to have the flame of God burn in your marriage. It'll cost you something to have the flame of God burn in your finances. It'll cost you something, church, to have a flame in this church. And it'll be more than me screaming in a microphone, get your own fire. Because there's a flame with your name. That'll preach. Look out. But nonetheless... It was the fire of God that went out from before his presence and it devoured up the sacrifice. So please, 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 I love you as your friend and shepherd to tell you, do not tell me, yourself, God, your friends, your spouse, your dog, your cat, or anybody else that you are consistently living in the presence of God when you do not have a life of sacrifice. Just don't. If you're not willing to burn down every relationship you have because God says so, then you're not willing to sacrifice. David said, I will not give to the Lord that which costs me nothing. And so many people want to live haphazard, loose, footloose and fancy free. They, they want to have no sacrificial element to their life because these days... Nobody wants to talk about Matthew 10, 38, where Jesus said, let a man deny himself, take up his cross daily, not every night again, daily, and follow me. You see, we think what that verse says is, if you're going to follow me, you have to be filled with self-indulgence and selfies on Instagram. You see, the American gospel is self-centered. The biblical gospel is Jesus-centered. Does that make sense? It's, it's really that elementary. It's that simple. And we've raised a generation or two, maybe three, where people are consumed with indulgence and they've been taught that it equals spirituality. When in the economy of God, in the kingdom of Jesus, sacrifice is the currency of the fire of God. It just is. Now, I want to go one step further and say this. I was reading something else the other day. I keep saying that because I keep reading. And you ever notice that there was a story in the Bible, if I'm just going to be honest, theologically, there's a story in the Bible, Pastor Jimmy, that just, it, it always kind of confused me. It's the first miracle Jesus ever performed when he turned water to wine, right? And, and the fact that he did it doesn't, doesn't bother me. And the fact that he turned water into wine doesn't bother me. He's Jesus. He can do whatever he wants to. What always got me was this. He did not show up at the wedding with the intention of doing a miracle. Matter of fact, he half-heartedly rebuked his mother for even bringing up the opportunity for him to have to do a parlor trick for the first time. And I was reading that and I thought, holy smokes alive. How did I miss this? So they ran out of wine in them big jugs, right? And here's what Mary, the mother of Jesus, said. Uh, son, they're out of wine. Can you help this party go up a notch? People getting grumpy. That, that they don't have any more wine. All we got is water. And Jesus said, woman, now look, I don't understand the theological implications of what I'm about to say, but I know practically you better be God in the flesh if you call your mama a woman in public. <laughs> woman. <laughs> he said, woman, my hour is not yet come. I don't have any time for that. My hour is not yet come. Jesus did not practically intend, he's God, he knew what he was going to do, 
to perform a miracle of turning water to wine at a marriage supper of Canaan of Galilee in John chapter number 2. First miracle ever. By the way, stop believing all that Mormon foolishness. Them books, well, you know, when Jesus was 12 years old, he walked out on the Sea of Galilee and raised a fish from the dead. No, the Bible says that that was the first miracle Jesus ever performed in John chapter 2. That was the first one. If Jesus said it was his first, I don't care what the Mormons tell you it was the first. Somebody say amen. Stop believing Google nonsense. So he said, woman, I'm not here for that. My hour is not yet come. Do you know what Mary did next? <laughs> Mind-blowing. Shocked me. I got to come down. It shocked me so much. Mary didn't get offended. She didn't rebuke him. She didn't say, I'm your mother. I'll ground you. He's a full-grown man. She said, they need some wine. He said, woman, my hour's not yet come. What have I to do with this? Fully intending on just showing up, attending. You know what Mary did? The very next breath out of her mouth, the very next breath of the Holy Spirit in the next verse. She turns and she said, whatever he tells you, do it. She knew her son pretty good. She didn't walk away, oh my goodness, he's not going to do anything. Nope. She knew he was about to do something. So he said, woman, I have nothing to do with this situation. What about, I, I, my hour's not here. It's not time for the revelation of who I am yet. They can't handle it yet. And so she turned around and said, hey, whatever my son tells you to do, do it. And he did it. Don't stone me, but I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> because faith and obedience are irresistible to God. Did you hear me? My hour's not come. I'm not here for a parlor trick. Hey, whatever he tells you, do it. Because when you operate in faith and sacrificial obedience, the presence of God irresistibly comes into your life and it becomes a theological game changer. Do you believe what I'm saying this morning? God's God. He can do what he wants to. But he said, look, without faith, it's impossible to believe God. Faith and obedience gets the attention of God. And it was when the sacrifice was placed on the altar, twice it says, and the glory of God showed up. But for a moment, we're going to stay in Leviticus. I want you to go to the next chapter. Things get very dicey here. Chapter 10, we're just going to move right into the next chapter. Verse 1, and Nadab and Abihu. Now, we know Aaron had four sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. Okay? We're not going to deal with Eleazar and Ithamar. They're later in the text. Nadab and Abihu, watch this. The sons of Aaron. Wait a minute. Throwing the Jake breaks. These are the sons of the high priest of Israel. He was the pastor above all the pastors. He was the high priest. He was the one that spoke with God on their behalf. And this is his priestly boys, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, right, and put fire therein and put incense thereon, which would normally... Be part of the sacrificial obedience system. But watch this. And offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. It wasn't time for that fire and that incense. He had not commanded that. They did that in the energy of their flesh. Why? Because they, like many people in church, say silly things like this. Well, I just discerned it was right in my spirit. Discernment in the flesh has destroyed the body of Christ in the United States of America. I just, I just sense it in my, there's something wrong with her. There's something wrong with them. I get it. Oh, boy, I got this gut feeling. Let me tell you something. Let me help you with something. Gut feeling is not a spiritual gift. Check your gut feeling by the Bible. Because we got people running around claiming everything in the world in church and they think they're all that, then some, and an extra size bag of chips and they're wonderful and they're like the Pope, they're ex cathedra, they're right there in the fellowship of God. But you know, it, it just so be God loves everybody they love and God hates everybody they hate. You ever notice that we honestly think in the theological world that God is reading our seminary books and agreeing with what we wrote? 
Now, I said this the other day when my wife and I were speaking on deliverance at Charles Karuki, so it's fresh on me, so I'm going to say it right here. How many of you ever heard the phrase, church hurt? Seek your hand. Yeah, all of us. We've all heard that. And I know no church like a church hurt. I get it. We, we all talk about church hurt, right? Well, I got church hurt, church hurt, church hurt. I can't trust the church because I got church hurt. I can't trust all preachers because, you know, a preacher disappointed me. Has your dentist ever disappointed you? Mine's disappointed me, but I've been to a few of them in 48 years. Hmm? Did you know the church world is the only place where we let people use a lousy excuse for being lukewarm and carnal? Right? We say things like this. Well, you know, I just, I just don't have a lot to do with the church because the church is just so sick. Let me tell you something. The church is the bride of Christ. He shed his blood for the church. You can get out of bed for it. And people say, I just, I just, I just can't go back. I, just, I can never serve the Lord because I got so much church hurt. All right, Skippy, let me ask you a question. Why don't you have Jim hurt? You've been a pastor for a long time. You ever heard somebody say, man, I've got Planet Fitness hurt, Pastor. Well, if you work it out, you probably do. Somebody picked up my dumbbells. Man, I tell you, I got so hurt at Planet Fitness, I ain't never going back. You keep going back at 6 in the morning. You ain't got gym hurt. You ever, listen, I go to Dunkin' Donuts all over the world. And I walk in and some of them know me. It's like I got a sponsorship from them. Every day of my life, two medium hot coffees, seven cream, five sugar. You said that's too much. You can preach next week. <laughs> it ain't enough. Do you know how many times I have to remake my coffee at Dunkin' Donuts? But I ain't never wrote them a letter and claimed Dunkin' Donuts hurt, and I ain't never coming back because y'all did me dirty. I had to remake my coffee. You see, the church world is the only place we let foolish people get away with that nonsense. Right? Am I right? You don't claim that anywhere. You've never claimed that at Walmart. And you probably could. I got Walmart hurt. I got grocery store hurt. I went to the grocery store and they rang me up. Wrong. They even rang me up something extra. They didn't even give me what I put and blah, blah, blah. I, I got Longhorn Steakhouse hurt. I ordered sweet tea, they gave me unsweet tea. I wanted medium well, and they gave me medium rare. I'm telling you, I ain't never going back to another steakhouse. You see, when you put it in that context, it sounds so juvenile, immature, and stupid, doesn't it? And yet there's people all over this town, well, I've just been so church hurt, I can't go back. You ain't been church hurt. You hurt yourself by not dwelling consistently in the power and in the presence of the glory of God and you put all your eggs in the basket of a church so when a church did not meet your unrealistic expectations or the preacher didn't shake your hand when you thought he ought to all of a sudden now your church hurt and the whole body of Christ suffers because of your spiritual discernment which is nothing more than a cloak for your lack of the presence of God in your life and that's the facts and it goes for me as much as it does anybody in this room it is sad that that's where we are but the Bible says the fire of God went out. I knew this down here somewhere. The fire of God went out and killed these boys. Why? Check this out. Verse 2. There went a fire from the Lord. Out. Again, not down. Out from the Lord. And devoured them. Devoured who? The priests. You see, God's an equal opportunist. <laughs> he don't pick on people. Went out of fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Now watch what God then shuts down, and we'll be done. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh to me. And before all the people, I will be, what? Glorified. And watch this. This, this, the high priest, and, get this, the daddy in the situation. Not just the boss and the pastor, the daddy. And it says, and Aaron held his peace. Hmm? Reverently, I say it this way. Aaron's like, I really want to say something about him killing my kids, but I don't want none of that especially in front of everybody, and he kept his mouth shut. And you know what God did? 
God showed us as we began the message in the introduction, now we end in the conclusion, God showed us that today this last level of glory when it comes upon us, what does it produce in our life and in the life of a congregation? Separation. God is separating the sheep from the goats. And we'll fully do it in the day of judgment, in the judgment of the nations. We get it. God's separating the, the wheat from the tares, the righteous from the self-righteous, the fakers from the anointed ones. And when the glory of God is truly being revealed and, for lack of terminology, manifested in our life, and we're walking holy and in the fear of the Lord, we will not continually and consistently tolerate things that we know are displeasing to God. It becomes strange fire. And there's a lot of churches where people are in those churches that seem to be half-decent, if not pretty well-meaning, sincere people that have strange fire. Strange fire. We do things that God never commanded. And we worship the doctrines of men over the commandments of God. And Jesus was plain to let the Pharisees and the religious crowd know that to be the truth. You draw near to me with your mouths, but your hearts are so very, very, very spiritually far from me. And there must be a level of, and even a layer of separation, a guardrail between us and what is happening in the culture. Because know this, what's happening in the culture is a result of the manifest presence of evil, not the manifest presence of the glory of God. So if we are walking in the glory of God, we cannot participate with what's happening in the world. We are in the world, but we are not of this world. There must be a level of separation from which we will not convictionally compromise at all. Amen. We will not, as we say, back up, pack up, slack up, shut up until we're taken up by the glory of God. And those people in the church world today, by and large, just don't have that type of conviction, that type of, as my granddaddy would say, fortitude. We don't have that type of resolve. But Jesus said, look, I do not want you offering to me strange fire, and I for sure don't want you offering me something that's leftovers from last week that cost you nothing at all. We could, we won't, shift gears and talk about a lot of strange things happening in the church world today. I think for a couple of minutes, I will say a couple of things that need to be said, need to be expressed. The Lord raised our church up, not Greg Locke, raised our church up for such a time as this, right? If I perish, I perish. Woe be unto us if we preach not the gospel of Jesus, right? We get it. We know the verses. But let me tell you why I think in this hour what we are moving into works. Because I am the guy that was against so much of what we now see, say, and believe to work, right? So here's what God said. God said, I'm going to give you a Saul to Paul Damascus Road experience like a little puppy. I'm going to open your eyes and I'm going to show you the reality that the kingdom of God, says Jesus, is not in word but in demonstration and in power of the Spirit. So most churches are filled with fluff and puff and words, but no demonstration of the power of the supernatural Holy Spirit. And that's a whole other message, and we ain't got time to get into all that, but it's remarkable to me where we are in this, not movement, but it is a move of the Lord. It's remarkable to me because here's why it works. Because I don't get up here and make up miracles, make up deliverance, tell a bunch of hokey, silly, charismaniac, ridiculous stories. You know why? Because I saw so much of that and it turned me off. So here's why it's working. God took the most least likely person to know anything about the realm of the charismatic world, put him right in the middle of the charismatic world, not just to be the biggest charismatic, but to be the biggest cheerleader of bringing truth and balance to a movement that has been known for much of strange fire that God has not been pleased with, and you know it's the case. There has to be a balance. You see, here's the balance, because I've been on both sides of the spectrum. I came out 
I use movement loosely again for all this. And I'm not being critical. I don't demonize my past. It gave me a, a heart for fundamentally wanting to preach the Bible and a heart for being a little bit on the abrasive side, which is okay. I came out of a movement that was all truth and no spirit. And was thrust into a movement that was all spirit and very little truth. And then the Lord raised up our platform. And God said, let me tell you what your job is, son. Preach spirit and truth. Because it's the perfect balance of who Jesus is and what the New Testament church is supposed to do. That's the authority that we have. That's why I can go back to all my Baptist preacher friends and be like, look, man, I'm not crazy. There really is the power of the Holy Spirit. People can get healed. Things still do happen. That there's things you can't explain. And if you can explain it with your three-pound brain, God didn't do it anyhow. You can't put God on a piece of medical paper. But we've watched him absolve those medical papers overnight through deliverance and healing ministry. And so I'm able to go to those friends and say, look, there really is more. Yes, of course it's the authority of the Word of God. But I want to remind you, the Trinity is not God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Bible. It's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit because the Scriptures mean nothing without the illumination and the revelation of the Holy Spirit because no prophecy is of any private interpretation. Every word of God is for our learning and for our admonition. And then I can come to the Pentecostal side and say, hey, cut out the foolishness and preach the Bible. Because you can dance in the aisles, you can wave flags. You can speak in 15 languages in unknown tongues. You can fly around this room. You can cast out demons to your voice is hoarse. But if you don't walk in the authority and truth of the word of the living God, which is our authority and our only truth, you are missing it on both sides. <laughs> I remember, and I know we, we, we got into a lot of public criticism for this, but I remember when I befriended <laughs> Benny Hinn. Man, we had people have a meltdown. I mean, I wrote a book about the guy 21 years ago, right? And it's not like we talk like every day. We, we, we probably talk a few minutes once a month. But it was interesting because Pastor Benny called me and he said, Hey, I, I heard you're going to be back in Orlando and I want you to come to one of my crusades and do deliverance. You talk about the most full circle surreal moment in my life. <laughs> I'm like, Greg Locke is going to do deliverance at a Benny Hinn crusade. He said, there's something about you, son. He said, man, you have one of the most authentic anointings of any preacher I've ever met. He said, there's a realness about you that I just like. He said, I'm drawn to you. And I'm like, okay, whatever. I'll come do deliverance at your conference. So I was already down there preaching for, you know, the weavers. And so I went over and it's when Ty ended up getting extraordinarily sick and all of that was going on at that time. So there was a lot happening. So I walked in late to this service and I'm sitting up on the platform. And I'll never forget. He said it publicly, so I guess he'll be okay with me saying it publicly. I'll never forget. I was sitting up there with a bunch of charismatic preachers, and he looked at all of them. He said, let me tell y'all something about this young man sitting beside you. He knows the Bible better than all of y'all combined. And I'm like, oh, dear pastor, not now, please. <laughs> and then here's what the most well-known charismatic preacher on the planet, and he's owned his past. He's owned it. Okay, get over that nonsense. People change. I'm not the same preacher I was a year ago, and you know it. And he turned around and he said, Son, if I had to do it all over again, I'd take your journey. And I was like, what do you mean? Well, I didn't have to ask him because he told me. He said, I'd start out a Baptist so I could know the Bible, then get baptized in the Holy Spirit and tear the whole charismatic world up. You see, we got to have both. Got to have both sides of it. You need spirit and truth. Jesus was that perfect balance, grace and truth. Not so much grace that you're greasy and lasciviousness and live in sin. But not so much truth that you're a jerk for Jesus and a Pharisee and nobody can do anything right unless they do it the way you tell them to. See, there's a balance. There's a balance. And I know I get laughed at everywhere I go because I cry more than I preach. But I think in this hour, in this season, that God's raised us up for a purpose. 
And the purpose is not so people can follow me and have millions of followers and a blue check mark. Who cares about influence? I don't want influence. I want authority in the kingdom. And there's a difference. I know influential pastors that couldn't cast a demon out of a poodle. Cannot successfully pastor an outhouse, but they have 10,000 people in their church. I don't want influence. I'll never again ask for influence, but every day I ask for authority. But I believe the Lord's raised us up for such a time as this to say, you know what? We want to see the miracles, the signs, the wonders. Of course we want to see healing. Of course we want to see deliverance. Of course salvation is the number one thing we want to see. Because salvation is the gospel. And then from there, you have the effects of the gospel, which is the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. But I think the Lord's raised us up to get people to understand it is time that you quit playing games. God is thinning out the ranks and raising up an army. He wants people that will lay down lukewarm, casual approach to the things of God. He wants a chapter a day keeps the devil away Christians to stop doing that nonsense and start getting in the authority of the Word of God. Start learning to fast and pray because this kind does not come out by prayer and fasting. And you can fast from social media. You can fast from driving a car. You can fast from watching Netflix. But there's only one fast in the Bible. You stop eating and you get in the presence of God. That's the only fast in the whole Bible so I don't know Brother Crockett I used to preach these cute sermons I never even had to circle the airport I knew when it started I knew it was going I knew it would end I knew how you were going to react I knew how to make you stand make you sin listen I wasn't preaching for response I knew how to make you respond any communicator can walk into a room and light it up like a light bulb. I got tired of preaching cute sermons. And when I began to walk in the glory of God, and I'm not anything special, but man, when I began to get in the Word so much more and began to learn, and I began to fast, and my wife and I began to take communion together every day in our house. Every day. I'm telling you, God flipped a switch in our house. Things begin to happen in this church that I cannot even describe God's doing things behind the scenes right now that I don't even know about and here I am in the midst of, of preaching a, a month long series of sermons that may be six months we're going to keep going contending for the glory of God until it really shows up and God shows us listen this is what I want to burn this foolishness out of you and in the midst of all of that God says I'm going to put you and your wife on a plane. I'm going to send you to the land of Israel with an Israeli pastor in Ashdod, which, by the way, his home is right down the street from where Dagon fell down before the Ark of the Covenant. So I'm looking forward to being there. It's going to be a history lesson. And God says, here you are preaching about the glory of God. I'm going to take you to the land of the originality of the glory of God and show you some things that will so shock and spiritually, supernaturally mesmerize you that, listen, I promise you right now, not a prophet nor a son of a prophet, but you better know this. I right this very moment know without a shadow of a doubt. It's an actual fact that we will not nor can we be the same pastors when we get back next week. I promise you, God is accelerating His work in the world. So stand with me just for a moment. I want to say this. I, I don't know what I'll end up teaching on next Sunday and Resurrection Sunday. I'll be so full, I, won't, I, I don't know. But I, I've got a sneaking suspicion God's about to rock my whole world. But I heard somebody say the other day, Charles Karuki, in fact, we was up there doing deliverance in Minneapolis and, and teaching the people about what the Bible theologically says about deliverance. And he said, you know, we got to get busy because, and he said this, and he's correct, but follow me. He said, because the days are getting darker. Of course they are. The Bible predicted that. In the last days, this know also, perilous times shall come. But you know what's interesting about days getting darker? Do you know what happens? And do you know the phenomenon for why days get darker? Because hours get shorter. It only gets dark when the day gets short. So I'm not really preaching to you that, hey, you got to get right and you got to get saved and you got to walk in his presence because the days are getting dark. No, they're supposed to get dark. I'm telling you, you need to do it because the days are getting short and you don't have much more time to get right with God. That's what I'm telling you. So right now, all over this room, 
Just as we're bowed before the Lord right now, this, this simplistic invitation right here. I want you to come, sir. I want you to come, visitor. I want you to come, young person. I want you to come, ma'am. I want you to come and fall right here at the steps of this altar and say, God, I'm tired of not having a heart for the glory and the presence. Baptize me in the authority of your word. Fill my marriage to overflowing with fresh oil. Some of you got a flame with your name. You're going to have to get your own fire. You're going to have to get your own stuff. You're going to have to get in God's prayer. Listen, you cannot just depend on my preaching once or twice a week to fill you up. You need to get as close to God. Make your house a peaceful portal to the heavenlies. When people walk in your home, they ought to sense, wow, the presence of God is here. Maybe some of you need to lay down some things that you're going to have to sacrifice, some relationships you're going to have to burn. Some things you're going to have to give over to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Maybe there's some things you're going to have to be separated from. Maybe some of you have been offering some strange fire. Oh, no, it's time to get full, full, full of the Word of God. You come, you come. You take your time. If you're here today and you followed the Lord in salvation, but you've never followed the Lord in believer's baptism, my right, your left, Miss Billy and the crews over there, we'll get your towels, we'll get your name tags, we'll get you ready to go. You just begin to line up. We've got some little changing rooms back here in the back. If you weren't quite ready yet, we'll line up in a few moments. We'll do those baptisms. Men in the morning, 6 o'clock, right here in the hospitality room. Wednesday night, still having church. Okay, we don't, we don't believe in that nonsense. Cats away, mice play. No, no, no. You get here Wednesday night, fill this place up like you've been doing on Wednesdays, and the glory of God's going to fall. This is not Greg Locke's church. It's God's church. It's going to fall. God's going to continue to do amazing things in our midst. Now, listen. They're going to sing. We, we never have an official dismissal. Sunday or Wednesday or any service for that matter at Global Vision. Never. We just tell folks, if you want to stay for baptisms, great. If you need to pray, great. If you need prayer right now, if you need prayer today, you come. One of our team will lay hands on you. We'll pray for you. We'll counsel you. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ, today's your day, sir. Today's your day, ma'am. Wednesday night, a man walked up to me. 75 years old. You don't see those often. 75 years old. Drove here from Wisconsin. Walked right up to me in the meet and greet line. I said, sir, what do you need? He said, I need Jesus and I need him right now. Do you think I kept meeting with people? No, just right there. Led him to Christ. Right there on the spot. If you need Jesus, this is your moment. This is your moment. What must you do to be saved? You repent. You believe the gospel. You come down. If you need prayer for healing, whatever it is, your marriage falling apart, whatever it is. So in saying that, they're going to worship. We're going to pray. I'm going to do baptismal celebrations. But if you want to stay, you stay. If you need to slip out, you slip out. And we say, we'll just pick up and reconvene in the glory of God in our next service, which for the men will be 6 o'clock in the morning. So we love you guys. But team, I want you to come. Just begin to sing. Just continue to, to usher in the goodness and the presence of the Lord. We're going to move over here to our baptismal celebrations. And we're going to watch God do some great things. Right down below us is a whole room packed full with GV Espanol. They're growing by leaps and bounds. It's unbelievable what God's doing. All kind of things happening on this campus right now behind the scenes that we don't even see. And we say to God be the glory. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. If you're glad you came to church today, shout hallelujah. <laughs> Team, I want you to just usher in some worship. You take your time. Keep praying. And we're going to move over to some baptismal celebrations. And again, we love you guys. We'll see you in the next service. Get around, hug each other, love each other. Let's be a family. Let's be a family.